Hi, my name is Megan Chambers. I'm a resident at the University of Washington, and today we're going to be looking at the gross features of some lungs. A couple of things. These lungs are a little bit different because they're autopsy lungs. So a lot of what you'll see if you're doing a surgical rotation or surgical residency is that you get the fresh tissue, which is oftentimes a little bit easier to work with. When things are fixed, they look a little bit more tan, a little bit more brown, and they're oftentimes a little bit harder or more firm. I think we'll still see some really good features though, so thanks for bearing in mind that these are autopsy specimens. To start, we have two right lobes. We know they're right because they each have three lobes. And so on the left, we have one that's fresh and therefore pink. We actually took it out about six hours ago, so it's already been in formalin for a little bit. And since it has already been cut and handled, it's also a little bit deflated. The sponginess and firmness are the sorts of things that are easier to appreciate when you can see and handle the specimen yourself, so for now, you'll have to take my word for it. This lung is also a healthy lung, but it's been in formalin, and so it's brown and firmer. But if we were to squeeze it, we can tell that it's still very spongy, and a lot of water is coming out of those air spaces. That suggests that our air spaces were filled with air prior to being fixed, rather than pathologic processes such as inflammation or fibrosis which would damage the air spaces. A couple other things to note on these otherwise healthy specimens are the lymph nodes. Generally speaking, they should be less than one centimeter in greatest dimension. These lymph nodes at the hilum frequently have quite a bit of anthracotic pigment in them. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with these nodes. It's a variant of normal and suggests that the person lived in a place that was either urban, had some pollution, or maybe they had a wood burning stove, etc. Pretty much everyone has some anthracotic pigment in their lymph nodes. These off to the side are your typical airways. Here's an artery. Other things to notice on this healthy lung include a nice, smooth, clean pleura, which if you were to touch it, feels silky. You can also see that we've sectioned out some of the pieces from this otherwise normal lung. I'm going to go ahead and leave this healthy lung on the right side as we go through the lungs. And that will give us a reference point for healthy lungs versus the pathologic lungs, which I'll keep on the left. One last thing that we want to think about when we're comparing our lung slices is whether we have a diffuse or a localized process. On the left, you can see that we have a very diffuse process. If I pick it up, I can tell that the same thing is happening at the top as is happening at the bottom. Compare this to the next one, which has this much more localized process. We can also consider whether processes are dependent at the bottom of the lung or apical at the top. We're gonna to split our modules into diffuse and localized process, starting with diffuse. So we have our normal lung and our abnormal lung. I think this view could look pretty similar. They have similar coloration, and you'll notice that this one looks really homogenous in its color, whereas this one's a little more patchy, especially if I bring it closer. We have some light tan areas, but we also have some darker areas and then some much darker areas. So there's some process here that's diffuse. It's involving all three lobes and also has some variation to it. This is an interstitial lung disease specimen. Outside of autopsy, these can also be seen as transplant specimens. You can see that on the surface, our pleura gets this cobblestoning or puckering. It's not smooth. It has some areas that are smooth, but it has other areas that are wrinkled or dimpled, which isn't just an artifact of processing. Other things to notice is that we get a lot of cystic spaces. I think here's a good example of some dependent cystic spaces. If you're thinking about a dependent but diffuse process, you could think about a hereditary alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. If you saw an apical process, you might think more COPD and non-hereditary causes. So one thing, and again, I know it's tricky if you're not able to actually touch it, but unlike the normal one where we squeeze and we get all of this water out, this one we squeeze and we get less water. And overall, it's much firmer, even after fixation. And that's, again, just because there's more fibrosis, more of a pathological process. So these tend to be really easy to cut, and we even get nice even cuts because they're already firm before we process them with formalin. This is a second interstitial airway lung. It's more advanced than the first, and we can see that it actually has these pretty diffuse cystic spaces. If I look closer, we can really see that there's large honeycombing areas that are empty and cystic, and that those are extending throughout each of the lobes. It still has that really dense and firm background feel to it, and we do see some airway enlargement and other features consistent with interstitial lung disease. I mentioned COPD with our last video, but this is an example. This one's fairly advanced, 
This was related to the cause of death for this patient. And as you can see that when I pick it up, it literally just has holes in it. That's the difference between interstitial lung disease and COPD from a gross examination perspective. Honeycomb change will create small to medium-sized cavitations in a fibrous background, but COPD creates large, thin-walled, and therefore floppy air spaces. These don't tend to preserve well, especially when they're in our teaching boxes and they're handled a lot, because so much of this is just air defects and empty. We get these large cystic spaces, and this one's pretty diffuse. You can tell that there's a little bit more at the top. It's much thinner up there compared to the bottom, where we still have more intact tissue. This suggests this person's COPD was from smoking rather than hereditary causes. And I know this from this person's chart review, that they were indeed a smoker. One thing to notice is that our pleura is pretty smooth, but compared to this guy, it's also a very different color. And that's from all that anthrocotic deposition related to smoking. That diffuse discoloration, along with some patchy areas where you can really see strong coloration, stands in contrast to this lung I'm holding, where we have more normal physiologic anthrocotic deposition scattered throughout the parenchyma, as well as seen in the pleura. Again, this one's really just a function of being in an urban or a smoke-filled environment. We're working away from our diffuse processes towards our more localized processes. This one is a little bit in between. The top two thirds of this lung are pretty normal. They look about the same color and consistency compared to our normal lung. The flexibility or pliability is also similar to our healthy lung, but the bottom third looks a little bit more tan and a little bit lighter. If we were to cut this lung fresh and squeeze, we might see off-white purulent exudates because this is pneumonia. This is a good classic case of pneumonia where it's in a lower lobe and it has also crossed into our middle lobe where we see some more focal infiltrates. Next, we'll be able to get into our truly localized processes. We're going to look at two lungs that both have a localized process. One has this mass and one has this mass. These are really different masses. We know from our step one preparation that we want to look at where the mass occurs. Is it near the airways, more centrally, or is it peripheral near the pleura? This is obviously something that's a little bit more peripheral. It's in the lower lobe. It's not involving any major airways, although there are some smaller airways associated with it. And it's pretty homogeneous throughout with an expansile to nodular pattern. This is an adenocarcinoma, and it's pretty classic for cancer, where it can have one or a couple lobules with a variably well-defined border that on microscopy would look infiltrative. That's in contrast to this mess, which looks a little bit harder to distinguish from the surrounding parenchyma, although it's quite visible. It has a lot of ectatic vessels associated with it, including some that are inside of the lesion, and it also has a heterogeneous color to it. So there's some tan, a little bit of brown, and some black. And all of those combined features are compatible with an infectious process, such as a fungal mass, which is what we have in this case. It's fundamentally different from the carcinoma because it has abundant inflammation and debris in it. It's going to have that superlative component, and if this was still fresh, it would be very friable and fall apart because it's forming less of a mass and more of an abscess. At this point, we're going to turn our attention away from the parenchyma to some of the other areas where we can get localized pathology. This first one is an example of a sarcoidosis lung. You can see that it has these prominent hilar lymph nodes. Lymphadenopathy is obviously a classic finding in sarcoidosis, and what we see on cross-section is a glassy appearance, where the black that we've seen in a lot of our healthier lungs is replaced by a white to tan white. A normal lymph node can be tan white to pink and very fleshy, but these will not only have a different color, as in pink, but also a different feel, especially prior to fixation. The tan white here are the granulomas of sarcoidosis. These two lungs look similar side by side. The parenchyma is approximately the same color. It's only on closer inspection that we see a classic finding of autopsy. It's a pulmonary embolus, and you can see it as an embedded thrombus in the vessel here. And this is really just to remind us not to forget to look at all the various components of our lung when we're assessing the gross pathology, because these emboli can be easy to miss, especially when they're more peripheral in smaller vessels. They should be dark red and adherent to the vessel, and they can be distinguished from post-mortem coagulation by histology, demonstrating lines of zon, which are alternating layers of fibrin and blood products. Thank you for all of your time, and in particular, thank you to the donors who provided these teaching materials at the University of Washington as part of their routine autopsy care.